Hello, everyone. I hope your evening is going fabulous. Mine is, for sure. So, tonight, let's talk about the myth of the Tatarian slash Tartarian civilization, as well as the mudslide hypothesis, or rather, the massive, covering a huge chunk of the world, mudslide hypothesis. <clears throat> now, personally, from what I've seen about this is that I personally do not buy that this actually um, was a wiping out of history or anything like this, or that a mudslide of that size actually had that degree of an effect. Um, if anything, if there was a mudslide in Siberia or those areas or whatever mudslides, plural, there may have been, it definitely was not a world sweeping um, total reset or anything even remotely like that. Nor would it be logistically possible for the British or whoever it was, the Yahudim, Khazarians, etc., to actually go out of their way to wipe out all the history and change. Because there's just too much books and literature that factually dates before um, this supposed stated mudslide from many, many different countries. You know, China, India, you know, Persia, you have stuff from Europe, you have stuff from Russia, um, Hungary. There's just so many references to um, a history that is distinct from what this mudslide hypothesis claims. So whatever variation of the hypothesis somebody adheres to, when I first heard about this thing, I was, I, I initially from right off the bat, immediately I knew it wasn't accurate. I knew that there wasn't this world sweeping mudslide and reset of history in that regards specifically. Um, and that the narrative was just inaccurate because I'd always known that the the Tatars, Tatars, Tartars, however you want to pronounce that, was just an alternate name for the various Mongol groups in Central and East Asia and also up into Siberia and into, you know, Eastern Europe, Crimea, Caucasus, etc., parts of the Middle East. So the Mongol Empire was definitely very expensive and Amongst the people themselves, referring to themselves as Tatars or Tartars or Tartars, they, these terminologies were used by people within their own lands back and forth. But what, there were some phases where people didn't like being referred to as Tatars or Tartars. They, they preferred to be referred to as Mongols. So how they referred to themselves kind of shifted around in, throughout different time periods of history within the region uh, based on specific contexts. And the reason for that was because Originally, when Genghis Khan united the various uh, groups within Mongolia, they went by all sorts of different tribal names. The main group that he had to take out after uniting the rest of them was the Tatars or the Tartars in the Far East, rather. And as far as I, I know, that the term Tartar with the extra R has a connection to Tartarus, um, in terms of like the European association with the region of Tartarus in Greek mythology or whatever, but the, the term uh, Tatar or um, Tatar basically was the, the term originally used. So once they were defeated and they were subsumed in the Mongol Empire, uh, they referred to themselves as the Mongols. And then later in history, various people throughout the region shifted back to referring themselves as Tatars and versus Mongols. And then certain leaders were like, you know, no, we're, we're Mongols. And they just considered Tatar to be kind of like a, an overgeneralized term that they didn't like because they wanted to be associated with being the descendants of Genghis Khan specifically. Um, so it's just kind of like, you know, if you live in a specific country or America, how you refer to yourself as it's going to vary how you prefer to be considered, you know, um, just kind of like if you're, you know, within the LDS church, you prefer to be referred to as LDS versus Mormon, but you understand in slang casual terms, everybody else refers to you as a Mormon. So it's kind of like that same thing with the, the Tatar stuff, T Tatar stuff and Mongol stuff. Right. And so a lot of that has to do with the fact that Europeans weren't really overly concerned with the area or the region, especially central or uh, Western Europe all that much. And that's why they just in their maps generalized it to Tataria, right. All in the East there. Um, which is Mongolia up through Siberia and <clears throat> all that jazz. And they didn't really, uh, because in their maps way back in the day, they would like, they would just blanket label areas that they weren't all that familiar with in terms of all that much detail. Right. So the main, the main flaw within this 
Tatarian civilization collapse and, and mudslide reset and all this other type of stuff. The main issue with that idea is that the logistics are just too extreme. Like there's the numbers, the amount of things that you would have to do, the amount of people that would have to be involved in something like that. It's just, it's just, it's logistically not feasible and it doesn't make any rational sense either why that would occur. Um, even though people propose hypothesis, okay, it may have occurred for this. They're trying to cover up this specific thing, but it's just, once again, it's, you run into the logistical problem. It's even if somebody wanted to do that, it's not logistically possible. There's too much that you would have to cover up. It's way, 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 way too much. Like it's just because there's, there's, there's too many people in the world for that to even happen. It's, it's not even doable, you know, especially if it's like British or Kazarians or uh Yahudim or something like that. It's not, um, you know, it's definitely, especially not. And when I say Yahudim, it's the accurate, accurate historical term for, the group known as the JEWs. Um, but I say Yahudim because that's more accurate historically, and that's what they refer to themselves as, actually. So, um, Yahudim, however you want to pronounce it, right? So, followers of Yah, in other words, Yahweh, so on and so forth. You get the gist of it. Um, so, the idea here is that, okay, the hypothesis goes that and there's different variations of it. There's people, you know, debating what they actually think the specifics were, but in just it's like, okay, there was a Tatarian civilization that was highly advanced and there were giants and all this stuff walking around in Mong Central Asia, Mongolia, Siberia, all that stuff. Um, they were like highly advanced technologically, spiritually, and otherwise they had this amazing civilization, so on and so forth, all that stuff. And then, um, there is a mudslide or series of mudslides or some catastrophe or whatever that brought down the majority of it. And then there were a few wars that took out the rest of them. And therefore from that point on, the history was altered and changed and erased. And basically what we now have as actual history or proposed to us as actual history, like going way back to like the Gallic wars with Caesar and the Greeks and out like ancient history. Basically a lot of people go so far as to say that ancient history itself was all fabricated, like all of it you know, like ancient history, like medieval history, like all of the claim is that like all of those things were fabricated, like top to bottom. But I'm just like the logistical nightmare of having to do something like that is insane. I mean, it's just, there's just too much. It, there's, <laughs> there's just too way too damn much. You would have to actually, um, and what would the, the it doesn't make any sense logistically either, because there would be no logistical functional points to it. Cause it's, it's pretty much irrelevant in the context of nowadays, okay, what happened in the past happened in the past. It's, it's like, okay, today is today. Like, so there's, there's a lot of holes in this hypothesis for so many reasons, but my study and my familiarity with Mongol culture and civilization was the biggest thing that when I looked at that, I was like, whoever came up with this, they just obviously don't understand clearly or correctly the nature of Mongol society or culture very well. So <clears throat> The reason the Mongols were so effective, and they would have remained more effective for far longer for uh, if they had done a few things, but um, the reason they were so effective was the same reason that they, due to infighting, um, were ineffective after Genghis Khan. Because So before Genghis Khan's time, you had a situation where Genghis Khan, or however you want to pronounce it, you had a situation where all the people, the tribes and groups throughout Mongolia were... There was a lot of infighting, but they were very effective at not being conquered or no one being able to actually take over their lands because literally they were always semi-nomadic. So they could just pack up and move at the drop of a hat, um, you know, either fully nomadic or semi-nomadic, at least they could just pick up an, at the drop of a hat and move like 200 miles away. No problem. So if the resources got scarce or if something went bad, they could just take off and move somewhere else. And so it made them almost impossible to conquer from outside sources and what also their advantage was, was the fact that they were able to be very good archers on horseback as well, after thousands of years of this being a tradition in those areas. Um, so you have the fastest form of land transportation of the time, plus the farthest reaching weapons and some of the most powerful bows in the world uh, combined in just this huge, massive horde that can just, you know, rush in, fire a huge amount of arrows at you and just take off afterwards without even being anywhere near you for you to launch a counterattack. I mean, and on top of that, the fact that they were really good fighters in person up close face to face because their lifestyle 
was a lifestyle of always like survival mode, right? Um, but it was a very effective survival mode lifestyle. So they were very gritty people in terms of they had a really strong amount of grit, an endurance ability to withstand all sorts of conditions and everything else. So that's why they were effective. Um, but in, in fact, in many ways, that kind of a civilization is in many ways more advanced than a stagnant society, even in a modern context where we're dependent on stationary areas and locales and not as effective as nomads, right? So if you're going to say that that lifestyle is what you're classifying as advanced, I would agree. In that context, it's more advanced, but it doesn't mean they had like, you know, flying saucers or like super levitation technology or any of this other type of stuff or like, you know, higher tech than we have today. It just means that for the time, that lifestyle was like the most effective in terms of, you know, conquering the largest amount of territory. I mean, they, they had the largest land empire that ever existed for that reason, you know, because once they were united, they were pretty much unstoppable. The only thing that stopped them was infighting amongst themselves. But once that was able to be squashed and they were able to unite, then, you know, they were extremely effective. But then after Genghis Khan passed, once again, things split up and divided because there was no strong enough personality like his to keep everybody united to that extent. Therefore, it just, they gradually dwindled and just kind of um, drifted into their own tribal groupings again. So, um, but a bunch of them were trying to claim that I I am the successor of Jing. No, I'm the successor, you know? So there's competition amongst like who considered themselves successors or not and stuff naturally. Right. But, um, and not everyone necessarily would classify themselves as his successor. Some of them just didn't want to have necessarily to do with that past legacy they just wanted to do their own thing depending on the particular group but um but the fact that there's still the strait of tataria between japan and russia between sakhalin specifically uh and the mainland of russia is very telling in this regards too so there's there's various good videos on youtube also but you even if you just study uh history itself you can understand two things. You can understand, okay, where people are misinterpreting information and why they're thinking this Tatarian hypothesis is correct. And you're also understanding like the logistics of the actual history, how that um, hypothesis arose. Because when I saw this, it was like, it was just so obvious to me, whoever came up with this or thought this up, isn't somebody who's that familiar with history. And, you know, somebody could, well, history was all changed. So therefore, you know, it's just all a lie. Let's like, hold on. The, So history isn't just based on written records. There's archaeology also, and there's also uh, dating of actual remains. But on top of that, there's just basic sense. I mean, amongst the cultures of Siberia, amongst the cultures of the Mongols, etc., you'd you'd have very clear, vivid, distinct cultural memory of such an advanced civilization. It'd still be there talked about within the cultures there. So within Siberia, within Mongolia, but they have a history of the Mongolian Empire. That's within their cultural narrative and history. That's still among the people that live there. But there's none of this Tatarian civilization past thing going on. It's just, it's not there. The reason it's not there is because it's not actually what their history was, you know? So instead of some outside person saying, well, no, your history actually was this. You're just duped to believe it was this. I mean, it's far better to ask the in-house people who actually live in the region what their own history is, you know? Um, So, and there was some especially weird things where people were showing like, early 1900s photos of like cities that were just completely fully built, but empty and connecting this to the whole Tatarian thing. I was like, hold on. And there's various uh, people on YouTube explaining this that, well, and you can even just like read actual books on this topic. Also, if you're familiar with photography and the history of it and stuff in those early days of photography, you could only capture still images depending on the type of photography you were using or the method you were using. So you wouldn't even be able to pick up on anything moving at all. That's why in like the early days, people had to stand really, really still um, in order to get their images properly in the photo whatsoever, because yeah, it, it can only pick up stillness versus stuff that was moving. Right. So if that's just moving around everywhere, it's like, yeah, of course you're not going to be able to pick up on people in the image and stuff, but they were trying to make it out the wall. There's just these completely empty cities that are fully built and all this type of stuff. And it's like, no, nah, that's not exactly what was happening here. It's, it's very misleading to describe that way. But if people don't understand photography, the history of it and what, what its limitations were back then, of course, they're going to just, Oh my God, you know, empty cities, nobody in it, you know? It's, so you get the drift of it, you know? Uh, <clears throat> and so, 
it's just, I would encourage folks who, you know, who take that seriously or who really believe that actually took place like that and the history was wiped and then all this other type of stuff. I highly encourage you to really deeply study Mongolia itself, study the actual Mongolian civilization, study even like in the modern context, how the, those people live in that region and all this other type of stuff. And you can understand and see how that false hypothesis would have been able to arise as a major misnomer from what actually happened historically, because you can just see how they're in real life successful, like how that lifestyle of nomadism is by itself effective to have a huge massive empire. If you get that type of people united, it doesn't require high technology to have that large of a land empire. You just have to have those kinds of people united under one banner in order to have that occur. That's really all there is to it, you know, because if you look at it like this before Genghis Khan united them, the majority of those territories that were later classified as Mongolia proper were already inhabited by tribes that were either nomadic or semi-nomadic. They were basically already various Tatar groups to begin with. And it just, it was formalized. Okay. We're one group now when the map, and then yes, they did expand into Europe to a certain extent. So they did spread out. They spread into China, India, you know, Persia, Middle East, Turkey, all that stuff. So yeah, they did expand beyond their standard lands, but a large amount of that land was already uh, Tatarian territory slash Mongol territory before um, they spread out into these other regions already, you know? So, and it was because of that lifestyle because they had the, they knew how to live in those environments, which are extremely harsh and extremely uh, in a lot of places, low resources. So they'd had to keep moving and their animals and the milk from their animals and all this other type of stuff was what they lived off of, right? So that's why milk stuff, cheese was such a big thing amongst them because that was their main food source that was always available versus, you know, hit and miss with like wild game or like, uh, you know, agriculture and stuff like that. They just had a, <clears throat> a reliable source of perpetual food from the animals they had in their big massive herds, you know? So um, just ready on hand that they could transport and move wherever they wanted to. So... Whereas pretty much all the rest of the civilizations were kind of uh, more stationary and stagnant in terms of their lack of ability to move effectively, right? But, so yeah. Um, if you have anything to say about this, please do so in the comments below. Please talk about your understanding of this topic or, you know, what you've heard about it or whatever. But, I mean, this is one that I never bought into for so many reasons. And right off the bat, it's because I'd already studied tons of history before reading this. And when I say studied history, I don't mean just automatically going, okay, I just read one book and then, okay, I accept whatever said in the book. No, it's just like you cross reference a lot of different sources. You just, and you also exercise basic sense too, beyond what you're reading. It's, it's, it's really not that complicated, honestly. And even just those two things can show you that there's logistical problems with the Tatarian thing of, massive proportions. There's major logistical issues with that kind of a cover up or a distortion or whatever. It's just, um, and the motive doesn't make sense either. The motive does not make any rational sense whatsoever. You know, people can claim all sorts of, that, well, it's tied into convincing people the earth is a globe versus a flat. And once again, that was the problem with the flat circular earth thing is that it's the logistical problem is too great in terms of the convincing of it and the motive thereof. It's, it's more work to cover something like that up and to convince people that that's the case than it is to just um, not lie to people. I mean, it, it's more work to go out of your way to lie and deceive people than it is not to. So it, once again, <clears throat> and there's many other reasons on top of that, but um, yeah, because the Tatarian thing, I, I started hearing that, about that like in 2015, 2018. Well, me specifically, I heard about it in around like 2018, 2019. And then just right off the bat, I knew it wasn't accurate. But then um, I'm sure it probably popped up earlier than that. Um, you know, but, you know, whatever the case may be with how soon the thing popped up. I mean, any any stuff, anything that starts to spread like wildfire just at a certain point in history, uh, you need to look at the social context of what that hypothesis is connected to because usually it's not just the tatarian hypothesis it's usually also connected to the flat circular earth it's usually connected to all these other things <clears throat> um 
beyond just that one hypothesis. And the hypothesis is usually used to justify some other thing, right? Some other conspiracy idea or whatever beyond just that. It's it's usually not just a standalone thing. It rarely ever is with this stuff, you know, <clears throat> but um, <clears throat> so yeah, if you, if you're really big or passionate about the Tatarian thing, the mud slide, cause I keep seeing people bring it up in comments in various channels. I leave comments on even on my channel. Uh, but it's just like, well, you know, definitely look into that and reconsider folks, because I mean, <clears throat> really understand the logistics of what it's like to live in those climates and those regions, specifically Mongolia and Siberia and understand the harshness of the environment um, would be an actual preventative source against anything highly advanced on a large scale at that time. Okay. Nowadays, yes, we have all these technologies. We can build like, you know, all sorts of buildings in pretty much any climate now with all these construction equipment and stuff. Back then the Mongol lifestyle was what made sense and was what would keep people alive in that environment, right? The way they built, the way they operated stuff. Um, <clears throat> so and also, if you understand and study Siberian tribal cultures as well, you understand that, okay, that's how you survive and live in those climates. It's, you know, um, and there's a lot of really clever, innovative things that they do with what they have available. It's quite incredible, in fact. But if you had, you know, and I'll, I'll talk about this in other videos, too, because there's a whole, like, ancient India being this hyper-advanced civilization, too. There's, And that's what I'm extremely familiar with, that hypothesis, um, which is also an exaggerated mythological one for many reasons. Uh, but the, all these different ideas where human society was like massively more advanced technologically in different time frames or whatever, it's just the vast majority of them are totally exaggerated at least minimum. And many of them are just flat lies and just flat, not accurate. They're, they're false narratives of the past that never occurred. Most realistically, if anything that happened in the past there was a small group of extraterrestrials at different phases in time who jumped the gun on certain things and in certain areas gave people certain aspects of knowledge that boosted them above other people for a while. And then they either died off or left the planet or whatever, but it would have been a very small number of these beings more than likely. And it would have been uh, a certain amount of involvement, but not a large scale to where the most of the humans, even the Kings wouldn't have actually understood or really been able to replicate the technology, whatever it was that they had or were given, they would have just, um, they just wouldn't have been able to do anything with it beyond like the extraterrestrial directly being there or involved or whatever, you know? So that's far more likely and far more realistic as a hypothesis, in my opinion, for many reasons, because there's a lot less to explain and it actually works and makes sense with what we see in the historical record. You know, it makes sense. Oh, okay, yeah, sure. There probably was a small amount of extraterrestrials or likely could have been, and this is what they were talking about, et cetera, you know. So, <clears throat> uh, but nothing any, nothing like really large scale though, uh, like across the board at one time. It just doesn't seem that that's the case, you know. <clears throat> um, so, I mean, in the Indi ancient India one, that goes like vastly into the past. Look, we're talking millions and billions of years in that particular hypothesis, right? Vedic scriptures are full of that stuff, you know, interplanetary travel and all this like hyper advanced everything. But it's like, wait a minute. The fact that we don't even have perspective drawings from that supposed civilization is like, that should be more telling than anything, you know? And this is a thing a person named Paul T. Harrell mentioned to me and Gora Raider and, and a few others. They mentioned these points to me and I was like, you know what? Those are actually some really good points, man. And so I looked into them further and actually really deeply thought about them. And I was like, yep, that's, the, what we're dealing with here is obviously an exaggeration. People may have contacted extraterrestrials and had some connection with them for a time. And that's what we're seeing in a lot of these texts. But as far as like anything lasting or permeating the society as a whole or something, uh, not really highly unlikely. And the historical record in terms of what actually happened does not show that, nor does the archeology. span um, But with that said, I hope to see what you have to say in the comments below and please be respectful and polite and consider the fact that people on this channel subscribed are deep thinkers. They're people who do genuinely contemplate these things. And if we hear about these things, we definitely at least take a moment of pause to actually think about them for a while. We don't just, you know, brush them aside instantly 
Um, there's reasons why we don't accept them if we do and vice versa. There's reasons why people believe them or buy them if they do. It's, it's not somebody being stupid or an idiot or brainwashed or any of this type of stuff. It's just people weighing the evidence that they see as reasonable or not and making their own decisions. It's not people being stupid. It's people thinking and either being accurate in what they are thinking or not. Um, so just keep that in mind. And with that, if you want to talk to me face to face about this or other topics on this channel, you can contact me gnosticantinatalist at gmail.com. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe if you found inspiration from this video and want to talk about it more. And please feel free to do a video response to this if you feel so inclined. And with that, I will talk to you soon. Have a good one.